So thank you for joining us today, Jose Luis, and uh, I give the floor to you now. <clears throat> thank you. Um, can you see my slides and can you hear me well? Yes. Perfect. So thanks a lot. Um, it's a great honor to, to present uh, uh, in this conference uh, as a keynote as well. And uh, the topic that I chose is a topic very related to the conference, uh, which is about carbon emissions <clears throat> and the bank lending channel. This is a research agenda that I have with uh, uh, Martin Kapercik, a colleague of mine at Imperial College uh, London. So basically, uh, let me ask. Uh, So, uh, basically, uh, there is no need to uh, introduce these first two slides uh, here in this audience, but let me just point out that, uh, you know, for instance, after the COP21, after the Paris Agreement, you know, there has been uh, a push toward decarbonization policies. Last year, Nobel Laureate uh, was a link between carbon emissions and temperature, temperature changes. Uh, with the objective of net neutrality. And there is an active debate on how to control emissions. May many uh, economists uh, believe that with a carbon tax, uh, all the issues would be solved. But many times it's difficult, uh, it's difficult to, you know, for political economy reasons, first, it's difficult to implement uh, taxes on, on brown activities. And there was a, a clear example uh, in France, right? Uh, just before the pandemic with, uh, with the gilet jaune uh, and, and taxes. And there is even a coordination uh, cost, which is maybe Sweden puts taxes on carbon, but not another country. Or Europe becomes tougher, and maybe US becomes softer. We saw the examples of Texas and West Virginia on uh, pushing back uh, on some investment funds and uh, investment banks, both. Uh, you know, in the sense that they were not patriotic enough because they were penalizing companies which were uh, employing a lot of people and they were fundamental for, for those particular states. So these are our are, are coordination costs across countries, but even within, within a country, there is a political economy issue. Also, those, uh, you know, the, the, the argument that carbon taxes uh, will solve all the problems, it's very good in a theoretical model, but, you know, in reality, is more maybe that's a fundamental thing, and, and, and maybe finance uh, follows that. But meanwhile, uh, meanwhile, uh, while the, you know, the, while there are this is, uh, there are this political cost, it's important to see whether the private sector is acting, uh, you know, uh, in a way of reducing carbon, and in particular the financial sector. And the financial sector is, is a major uh, player of, of providing disciplines. And there is evidence uh, that the cost, there is a cost of capital channel, meaning that uh, companies which are more brown, they tend to have uh, lower prices um, in the market. So they are penalized on the prices just because, uh, just because of, of this brown activity. It's like another risk channel. Um, so the people who follow the asset pricing, as, as there are channels, as there are factors, for instance, the CAPM factor, the capital asset pricing uh, model, there are other factors. Another one will be this uh, carbon emission. And there is also a lot of issues about activism. You know, like if you are, a, like, say, you are Northern Rock, and, uh, sorry, you are, you are, you know, one of the Fidelity, for instance, you, or Black Rock, and you go to a, to a company and then you push for green, uh, for green policies, and you, you try to discipline in that way. But there is not evidence whether it actually works. So whether it actually reduces uh, carbon emissions. There is another issue, which is in most countries around the world, the banking sector is dominant. And I will discuss uh, this now. So our paper is going to talk about the banking sector and whether it actually works, whether it actually works in general, and we will take an integrated view of the banking sector. I'm going to do the, this introduction, and after the, after the end of the introduction, I would love to receive questions if you have questions, 
because I'm going to summarize the, the paper uh, in this in this introduction. Still, in, in the motivation, so you know, to talk about the role of banks in the European banking authority is like is like uh, you know. I, but let me put you know let me put this slide even if you all know about all these topics so well. You know, like the banking sector can be an important player in the climate, uh, you know, discussion because it has an ability through loan volume and price. It has an ability to impose cost on uh, brown firms and uh, put money into green firms or within brown firms to make a transition finance uh, so that the brown firms become uh, less brown and more green. Okay. And what is different from the market? It's different in several ways from private, from public markets. Firms, you know, most firms around the world are private. In Europe, many big firms are private, also in Asia. And they rely mainly on banks. In geography, there are places, I mean, if you look at truly the data, the small and medium enterprises is not the case, but you could say that the United States and the UK, they are more market-based, and say continental Europe, Asia, and other, and other regions of the world, and in particular continental Europe, uh, is a more bank base. Another thing is that bank loan decisions are more lasting. And this is because there are greater adjustment of cost. I mean, there are, you, you can sell loans in the secondary market or you can bundle loans and do securitization, but it's much more difficult because those loans are much more illiquid. Uh, is much more difficult as compared to capital markets, in which it's much easier uh, to sell, uh, you know, bonds or stocks in a secondary market. Okay, so in that sense, uh, the banking sector, you know, like the, the capital markets is, uh, you know, the exit strategy is much easier than in the banking sector. If you think about exit and boys, uh, thinking of his life, um, his, sorry, his man, uh, book uh, in the 1960s and 70s. There is, apart from this, there is increasing pressure on, on banking sector to decarbonize. The European Banking Authority is there at the, at the forefront in the sense that the European Banking Authority, the European Central Bank, the Bank of England, central banks, also central banks, not only regulators, but central banks, you know, are making more, are putting more pressure on the banks first to include, to disclose more, to have more transparency. I mean, it's very difficult to a key issue in this, uh, in this problem is to, to measure, but to measure you need transparency and transparency and measurement are crucial. And many times with the stress test, it's not so much, it's, it's not so important sometimes, you know, I, I'm, I'm saying this here where, where you know this in finally much better than me, but many times in the stress test, it's not only the stress test per se, but the asset quality review, which brings all the transparency and measurement of the risks of the banking sector, and in this particular case, the brown, uh, the brown, uh, you know, uh, exposure. Central banks are discussing other issues. Like for instance, the European Central Bank has been discussing the quantitative easing. Should they buy uh, securities from companies which are brown uh, in the collateral when the ECB uh, or the Euro system borrow uh, against collateral in repo operations? Should the collateral uh, be, be brown uh, or should be penalized in a sense, you know, like, the, like there is a penalization in the rating, the lower rating you have and the higher maturity, the higher the haircut of the collateral to have something similar for brown versus, versus green activities. Another thing that, you know, these are things which I have, you know, in discussion eh, in a sense, potentially, are capital requirements. Uh, I presented this paper in, into, the, into the US Treasury uh, in the United States, and you know, they, they were very worried about this one, capital requirements. That would be very tough, no? Capital requirements based on uh, lending uh, or, or assets uh, from brown, uh, coming from brown activity. Okay, that would be very, very, for, you know, for banks, capital is very costly, uh, and that, that would be very, you know, hurt a lot, the bank, the banking sector. The collateral, I mean, now with the tightening of monetary policy, maybe it's changing, but we have lived a wall of a lot of, of huge liquidity. So maybe the collateral is not so important, or it used to be not so important as capital requirements. We'll see now with the tightening of monetary policy, but capital requirements for sure is something which would be costly for banks. 
this is this is like a public like a public coordination. So it's the central banks. Uh, so the previous slide was Paris Agreement, the COP21 last year, uh, the COP26 in Glasgow. Uh, and everything is like about, about, about the public. Now, there is also private commitments, like that is like a coordination across uh, private institutions, that is not state owned institutions. And one famous one is like the one, for instance, with the Net Zero Banking Alliance uh, from last year. Okay, so there is a lot of uh, commitments, a lot of private initiatives involving commitments both for non-financial firms and for financial firms, and in this case for banks, to reduce carbon emissions and to get zone neutrality. Of course, you hear, you, you wonder whether it's, there is greenwashing, no? Uh, I don't remember whether it was the HSBC guy, no? Uh, that was sacked uh, a couple of months ago for uh, some of these issues. So one of our paper will also will check commitments and will check issues like greenwashing and things like that. You know, some data like the 60 major banks, you know, have allocated like almost 5 trillion into fossil fuel industry since 2015. But let me say one thing about the problem of this type of, uh, you know, headlines, which is if you think about energy, uh, the, the sector in energy, there is a lot of variation within that sector, right? There will be green companies producing more green energy versus more brown type of energy. So one, one key point that I want to say is that it's important that, that there is a lot of uh, firm level heterogeneity within industries. So one should not check just purely this industry versus that industry versus that industry, because within each industry, there is, uh, there is a lot of variation, um, you know, and then companies like since uh, we are in France, no? like Total, it's a big company doing many things, so you can there can be maybe a transition from more brown activities to green activities. So you what you would like, like uh, is you know in the ideal world is even within the company, but also uh, at least within different companies in the same in the same sector. Okay, one thing which is not clear fully clear at all. I mean, physical risk. Many uh, scientists say it's clear. Uh, you know. We go where we go, uh, unless we do something. But the transition risk is not fully clear. Like, for instance, transition, and, and I don't think that sometimes in the stress test, you know, like you, you correct me otherwise. For instance, in the Bank of England, I think they didn't model transition risk, and of course, the, the transition risk is a more shorter horizon. It's not super clear, and this might be hurting banks uh, more. Of course, this preoccupation. Of um, of climate change is uh, is is super important, but this year uh, with the inflation, uh, the war, uh, the changes in monetary policy uh, rates, there are other things like potential recession, there are other things which matter a lot, and so I don't know whether in the next uh, two or three years the transition of this will be very important, but it's something which is not fully clear um, what is the horizon for the transition uh, risk. Okay, so this is the motivation. Uh, uh, let me just two more slides, and then I, I'm very happy to take uh, questions or comments. Um, so, what do we do in this paper? So, we ask first, very briefly, whether banks decarbonize their portfolio. But that's not the question that we are pushing. The question that we are truly, I mean, this is like a, a necessary condition, but the question that we are more pushing, if there was this necessary condition, for some banks, not for all the banks, but for some banks, is whether bank decarbonization triggers real adjustments in non-financial firms. Okay, so this is the question of this paper. And this is important on the effects on financial decisions like leverage, real decisions like capex, like investment, like asset, you know, and then effects on emissions, on, you know, on CO2 emissions, on scope number one, scope number two, scope number three, or commitments to future emissions, to future reduction in emissions. Now, how do we tackle this? This is the question of the paper. But then how do we address this particular question? We're going to address it in the context of bank commitments. So some banks formally commit to decarbonization. Other banks do not formally commit to decarbonization. 
we're going to take one particular uh, initiative. I will tell you later, but it's the science-based uh, uh, initiative. And we use these com commitments for two things. When, as a, one, as a question itself, it's interesting, it's an interesting question, which is, are these bank commitments greenwashing? You know, like it's public relationships. And just to say, I want to do this, but truly, truly speaking, I'm not doing this. Uh, you know, there has been, like the other day, uh, you know, uh, there was some advertisements in the, U I think in the UK, you know, and, and the agency for advertisement, I think they, 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 they you know, they went to the company and said, you cannot advertise this because that's not true. So in a sense, it's, it's some kind, kind of public relations, PR, greenwashing, or truly speaking, these commitments, there is an associated change in behavior. Okay. And then if this is true, if suppose that there was a, a truly change in behavior, the banks are changing, but do they, do they bring, do they drive changes in the real sector? Okay. In the ones that truly pollute. Second thing, we use these commitments not only as a question by itself, but as an identification. Remember that our paper is thinking more about the first. So for a bank, it's a decision whether I want to commit or I don't want to commit. But to a firm that was borrowing from this bank and had a relationship with the bank long before or before the bank commits to carbon uh, you know, neutrality, for instance, for that bank, for that firm, it's a shock. So if I rely on Santander Bank as for my business since say 2010 or, 20, or 2008 or 2012 or 2003, and then Bank of Santander uh, commits to carbon neutrality, just to put an example, in 2016, that will be a shock to me if I am a brown firm. Okay? Uh, potentially. And this, this might change the type of lending or the type of activities which I have to do. It might change in the sense that they might cut my lending to me because I am brown, or they can force me to do most, more transition finance to try to get more that I, be, I become more green. So for these firms are going to be potentially shocked by this commitment. So of course, firms can switch. So from Santander, I can switch to BBVA or Acacia. But you know, there are frictions in these markets. I mean, we do know that there are frictions in the banking market. And therefore, sometimes changing is not so easy. In the paper, there is a lot, a big part on the paper. Uh, maybe we will not go into, into this uh, presentation, but a, a big part of the paper is just to say that the companies that borrow from one type of bank, which commits versus the company that borrow from the bank that doesn't commit, they are not different. So first of all, there is a stag, a stag, they are not different on observable characteristics and unobservable characteristics through several ways. Also, these commitments of the banks and therefore the effects on the firms are uh, over time in different moments. So not all of us commit at the same time. So this is not like the typical uh, paper about pre-post Paris, Paris uh, COP21 agreement, which is one point before and one point after. But this is like a banks over time uh, commit uh, to, these, uh, to these activities. We will analyze until 2020, until the COVID, because the COVID uh, year is a particular year uh, in which you know there was a lot of reduction uh, in CO2 emissions, but it was driven by lockdowns and, and you know lockdowns, uh, you know lower demand, uh, lower supply, etc. So let me is it clear? Do you have any comment at this moment? Before I tell you the preview of the main results, is there any comment or any question? that you want to raise or anything? Okay, so let me just tell you the results. And with this, the rest of the paper is just details. So the lending effects. So firms with higher CO2 uh, emission levels, which we call brown firms for simplification, uh, all the results are going to come from scope number one. So the, we don't have results for scope number two and scope number three, which is reassuring because scope number one is more um, easy to verify uh, and monitor. If you think about scope number three, it's super complicated. For the ones that don't know scope number one, scope number one is the, the, the CO2 that you produce in your activity 
we, while scope number three will be your customers and suppliers, uh, which is entering into the network, which is not clear because you need to have a very precise network to do those type of analysis. Okay. So firms that have uh, that are more brown exante that were borrowing exante from banks that will make the carbon commitments subsequently after the banks made the carbon commitments reduction in carbon subsequently these firms will receive less bank credit and not only they receive less bank credit but they will reduce uh, will receive less total debt that is that is those firms which are brown and were borrow, borrowing from banks in which uh, they make the commitment to reduce carbon, they are going to receive less uh, bank credit. This bank credit is going to be from the banks that commit the, the reduction in bank credit. This is not going to be substituted by other banks and by not banks fully. They substitute half of it and not fully. And this will imply a reduction in total debt. It's a credit supply that is a bank's mechanism in the sense like, this is going to, these firms are going to have lower volume and higher price, consistent with supply. Okay, so higher price, lower volume. We can also have loan level results. So, for instance, within a syndicated loan, we can see that the banks that commit uh, versus the banks that uh, do not commit to a brown firm, the banks that commit after the commitment will reduce the participation as compared to the non-committed banks. And this is within the same firm at the same time, it's within the same loan, in a syndicated loan. So this is clearly coming from the bank and not from the firm. All the effects are coming from the banks, none, none of the effect is coming from the non-banks. We don't find leakage in the sense like, we find like a reduction of, like a leakage of 50%, but this is, this is a perfect substitution, but in a sense, we don't find that the, the non-banks completely, uh, you know, kill the result. As I said, the economic effects are half after the substitution. This will be the lending effects. But then there are the real effects. The real effects are, you know, this reduction in bank lending to grant firms. So they, they get lower lending. The firms are going to get lower leverage. They are not going to get a change in equity. And since they got, so they don't increase equity or reduce equity by paying dividends or increase equity, like reducing dividends or, uh, you know, or doing a, a seasonal equity offering. So they, they borrow, uh, they, 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 they reduce the leverage and consistently they reduce the capex, the investment and the assets, the total assets. Since these firms are financially constrained, I mean, they are coming constrained from the banks, consistent with many theoretical models, firms increase liquid assets. At times when you are constrained, you increase uh, liquid assets like precautionary motives, which are very well. So these are non-financial firms, but since you know we are the European uh, Bank Authority, this is very well understood for banks as well. Like banks, whenever they have uncertainty or constraints, they increase uh, liquid assets. And one thing, one result that might look weird is that they increase return on assets. And I'm going to come back to this point in a moment. Okay. But basically, they cut everything except for liquid assets and return assets. This is very understandable. This one is not so clear at the beginning, but let me tell you what, else, what is our, our hypothesis. There is going to be nonlinear effects. Effects are much stronger in the, in the, in the, browns, the brownness firms, the more brown firms. And importantly, for the paper, crucially for the paper, there is no subsequent uh, reduction in carbon emissions over three years, which is the maximum that we can analyze, three years. So not, not change at all on carbon emission over three years, not even firm commitments over year four, year five, year six, year seven. So not only three years of actual no reduction in carbon emissions, but no change uh, in future, even more uh, future years uh, on uh, commitments for future reduction. But instead, on the E, ESG, on these uh, ESG ratings, we see that the E of the ESG improves. Not the S, not the G, only the E. And then when we go to the E, only one factor makes the E improve. 
which is a factor which is called opportunities. And opportunities is that if in the future I have opportunities, we will take advantage of those opportunities. So it's a communication channel. And then if there is no actual carbon emissions over three years, not even commitments of future reductions in year four, five, six, and within the E of the ESG only improves the communication channel, it seems reasonable to, to conclude that there is some greenwashing from the firms, but no actual reduction on, on actual things that matter like carbon emissions. And this is makes banks consistent. This is another result. Eh? This makes banks consistent to cut lending because the firms are not changing. And in fact, the return on assets, since you see the assets are going down, but the reduction is not going down, brown over total assets is going up, right? If brown doesn't go down and assets go down, CO2 emissions over assets goes up. How can it be? And the return and assets are going down and the return on assets are going up. Is that bank, sorry, firms are selling those assets which are a bit more green and they concentrate on more brown assets on average. And those, and why? Because those assets have a higher return, a higher profit, profitability. And that's why they get higher return on assets. And consistently banks cut. So the bottom line of this paper, and with this uh, I stop uh, for questions, is that banks affect in our in the data that we have, which is US, Asia, and Europe for listed firms until the COVID crisis, is that banks affect carbon emissions via credit reallocation from brown to green firms on average, not, this is not all the firms on average, rather than providing loans to brown firms for the investment necessary to car car carbon emissions. So you don't make a, a brown firm more green on average by putting loans with covenants, uh, you know, attached to covenants or, or reduction in interest rates attached to a particular steps, no, that they do for particular projects, more green projects on average. You know, if you, if you are brown on average, I cut from you and I put the money into green. And this is the way banks are affecting uh, the climate change. And, and firms, and, and the reason is that firms on average, you know, uh, in this period, they were more profitable uh, for them to continue doing brown. They do brown and they get more profitability. And basically this is our paper. The rest of the papers are just details and things like that. And so I would be very happy to, to get comments or questions, suggestions from you guys, if there, are, if there is any. Okay, thank you very much. We have one question from the floor here. One second, that we bring the microphone over. Uh, hi, thanks a lot. I'm Margherita Giuzio from the European Central Bank. So, thanks a lot for, for the very interesting uh, presentation. I have uh, a few questions on um, the um, interpretation of, of the results uh, and on the data that you choose. So, first, uh, um, do you think that there is, uh, you know, heterogeneity uh, across banks? Uh, so I'm thinking, for example, some specialized banks that have concentrated portfolios in, uh, in some high-emitting sectors. It would be interesting to see how uh, they have been moving if they have uh, set also higher or lower um, ambitions targets. Uh, so if you can show also some uh, heterogeneity in the first uh, part, you know, in the descriptives of their targets. And also, how uh, does this um, depend on the external cost to, to the re related to the transition? So, for example, of firms being subject to um, carbon price uh, or uh, in Europe, the uh, EU ETS, and also how this relates to the firm's commitments. So um, do you find that if firms, even in high emitting sectors, have uh, you know, a sort of transition, an incredible uh, transition path, uh, uh, are they also sort of penalized by the fact that banks do have their own commitments? And then I have other two questions, sorry. 
if, uh, if you find that the emission of banks uh, reduce as a result. So is this policy uh, effective for their own targets? Um, and last, um, I'm curious why you consider only listed firms? Uh, is it because of the data uh, availability? Because, I mean, for example, in Europe, the firms in high emitting sectors are mostly non-listed, and also firms that are generally financed by banks are SMEs. So I'm curious to see um, what, how, how you think your results can be generalized for these small firms. Thanks. So there were quite a few questions, so maybe, Jose Lu, you want to answer this <clears throat> before we take more from the floor. Yes, yes. So, so the presentation continues, like, you know, there is the data, the data sets, and then, you know, it's a long, it's a long presentation, but, you know, rather than go into all these details, so I, I, I thought to do the introduction and take 10 questions, and then, uh, depending on that, um, I, I would continue on the presentation. Let me let me say that uh, these are truly amazing questions. So, so many, many thanks for the questions. So uh, there are many. <clears throat> um, so let me say, let me start with the ones that um, we do in this paper. So on the firm commitments, we don't find anything on the firm commitments over and above the bank commitments. So so most probably I don't have it here. I think I don't have it here, but it's in the paper. The paper, the paper is on the web, uh, but I, I, let me see whether I have it here. It's, it's here. I have it here. So, the, you know, like we explore this channel of whether, you know, whether non-financial firm commitments do an effect over and above the bank commitments, but uh, we don't find that, um, you know, affect banks' decisions to extend credit. That is, suppose that you, you basically promise that you will do these things, but you actually, you know, you are actually a brown fur on average. We, we don't find that the banks um, change their behavior. Okay, so so we do we did this uh, in the paper and we didn't find anything. With a colleague of yours, uh, Luke Levin, the Director General of Research, um, we are analyzing the carbon price in Europe and, and the interaction with commitment. So this is something that we are doing. Uh, and it's another 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 project. So uh, in here it would be it would be uh, very very big. Your question on brown assets. Uh, so these are so that question to me is super interesting. So so uh, so these two questions are very interesting. One we did it. The other we are trying, it, uh, but we didn't find anything. The other we are trying to do uh, to 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 get some results on the heterogeneity of banks. You know, there are some characteristics which make some banks to take commitments rather than other ones. But one thing which is super interesting, which you are saying, is, is like, and I think there, there, uh, in, the, in the conference, you know, I, I've seen uh, most of the paper in, in other places from the conference. And there is, I think, a paper in the conference in which shows that, um, or I've seen authors in which shows that depending on your, you know, your legacy assets, whether you have more brown assets versus less brown assets, you will have a different behavior. So not only brown will make you to, have to be less hesitant to, to commit potentially, but um, but in a sense, you know, like it's difficult for you to hurt brown firms if your legacy assets are brown. This is not something that we do in the paper, but it's something super, uh, super interesting. Uh, on the final questions, on the private firms, I know the ECB in the European Central Bank, for instance, you have a big, uh, you know, um, you're, you're measuring private firms emissions, but, um, but you know, and even there are in other places which are measuring scope number three and also have a, something on scope number three, measurement of scope number three, but that, that's a very complicated thing. So both, uh, and so basically, so we use uh, we use true cost, and this data is for basically listed firms. The most important thing for listed firms is that then we can match it. If we, our paper is about Asia, Europe, and United States, so we need to to match it to firm level data, and firm level data not for Europe but for the rest of the world is much better for listed versus non-listed firms. 
Uh, and then also we want this non-bank versus bank. Uh, and, you know, this is not for all the firms. But then on the measurement of scope number one or scope number two, is much better, uh, you know, the data is much better for listed firms than for non-listed. Um, then I am in the, I am a board member in, in a, in a state-owned bank in Spain. And, uh, you know, we face this problem that when we give loans to SMEs, because we give loans to SMEs, not to large firms, it's extremely difficult to, to measure the, you know, these things like scope one, two, three. Well, scope three is impossible, but uh, with with our data, but say scope number one, and that's a problem. And I know that at the at the ECB, you are making a big effort on on those things. Let me stress that one should not take an SME, uh, no, um, scope number one, based on the average of the of the industry, because there might be a lot of variation, as I was saying. Within the same uh, within the same industry, um, and I think I, I answered all your your points. Uh, so they are all comments are super well taken. They, they are very helpful. So thanks a lot. So, so we have uh, one more question from the floor. Yeah, uh, thanks. Very interesting paper. Also, I, I guess let let me try and be the policy guy for two seconds. Right, what? What makes me kind of comfortable is that what you're showing is basically consistent with people understanding that if they have a, if you have a choice between quantity and price uh, controls, you should choose quantities if you have, <laughs> if you're a Weizmann kind of person, right? So the problem I have is that banks are now choosing quantities, right, rather than prices because they are unsure as to what optimum is, but. So your treatment is basically identifying the banks that have a, an incentive to choose quantities. That's what they that's what they do. So that's in a sense, you know, as an economist, that makes me a little bit less worried about banks and the competence level. They seem to understand that at least. The problem I have is from a, a policy, sort of a broader policy welfare perspective, right? We know that actually it's probably exactly the other way around if we want to achieve lower emissions, that taxes are a much more effective way of doing it, right? Because that, that's what, the, what it looks like at the societal level, right? So what banks are doing, which makes perfectly individual sense for them rational, is a direct contradiction to what is probably the optimal policy tool for society, right? So, so I, I find it... I think that's at least worth flagging that you, you end up in a place which, I mean, we can debate if that's what we actually want to happen, right? Yeah? So I know, half, half question, half comment, yeah? Yes, so yeah. it's a very, very relevant comment. So, so, so I partially agree. So the, let me say, since you have a, per, a partial uh, half comment, Half question. Let me just say that I half I half agree. I half disagree. So so I agree on two things. So first, I, I, this is the result. So uh, let me just say that you know this on interest expensive. These results are very small. So they are two percent of the mean. So you know when you commit the firm associated to you is going to have a higher interest. Uh, uh, payments, but it's going to be small. I mean, 2% of the mean, which is 4% of the standard deviation. While for quantities, it's very big. Uh, so let me see, for quantities, just to put a number, is around, depending on the results, if it is bank debt, it's around 12% reduction. So our result is mainly on quantities, not on prices, as you were saying. And I agree that... Uh, that if we think about a Peruvian no, war, you know, you, you, you distort, I mean, distort in the sense of, you, you know, you make the, like a wage, you increase the price so that the people uh, would react by consuming less, in this case, by producing, by doing le by producing less emissions of CO2. Um, quantities, truly speaking, so here, the quantity, so I'm telling you, then in this way, I tell you the paper, I'm telling you this, the paper. So the quantities, 
In fact, it's coming from the extensive margin rather than the intensive margin. It's like they cut. It's like I don't want, on average, I cut many brown loans. It's not that I cut, even I cut, say, from 10% of, of the loan that I have uh, in a particular syndicated loan to a 5%. Is on average, I cut from 10% to zero. So it's more on the extensive margin, that is, I cut uh, those loans, that I just reduce in the intensive margin. Now, on the part that I, I disagree in part. First, one can think many times in banking uh, that a reduction in volume is that you put a price which is too high. And, uh, you know, it's like, you know, the marginal price that would be there, you know, the shadow cost will be so high that then there is no, no quantity. So it, it's related to prices. The second thing is that since you are in, since you are in the European Banking Authority, since you are in, we are in the European Banking Authority, regulation in banking is about quantities. So if we think about uh, capital regulation, liquidity regulation, these are quantities. They are not prices. Now there could be a price regulation. Think about think about net stable funding ratio. Net stable funding ratio, instead of being a ratio, it could be that if you borrow from shorter for uh, U.S. money market mutual funds or for whatever, uh, then uh, then uh, you know you have to have a higher cost. You know, like we are going to have a higher cost. It's like like a tax. But we don't do that. You don't do that. Uh, we do quantities. So even the regulation in bank is about quantities versus prices. Second, we don't know what is the right price. Uh, you know, like and second and final, it's difficult to know what would be the right the right price. And the right price, going to the previous questions, I think uh, from Mar Marguerite, if I I, I, got, I got the name correctly, uh, you know, like it's important to understand how both the pricing of carbon uh, with the banking, how they interact. It's not so obvious how the two, uh, how the two interact. But you know, you, you're, you're, you're on the fundamental, I completely agree that there are, you know, pr you know there, there could be a much better way to do this. And, uh, you know, and combining, uh, you know, prices, not only prices in banking, but prices in, you know, it will, you know, it would be nice to know whether if there is a carbon tax, what the banks are doing uh, for that particular. So are they are they making it more effective? In a sense, you know, you can you can think that a carbon tax by changing the prices, it will change the behavior of the banks, and the banks could add like like in a Bernanke Gilchrist type of model, like a, a Gerler, like a you know like a premium over and above. There is another question by uh, in the chat by Katia, Katia about the syndicated loans. This is the data. So the syndicated loans, uh, well, are, are, they are nice for things like this. Like you can have a syndicated loans. You can have within the same syndicate, you will have people that borrow. Uh, so borrow from committed banks, borrow from non-committed banks. And you can put, from, you know, you, you can analyze the same loan at the same time coming from a committed bank versus a non-committed bank. And that's very good for identification. Then, this is one thing. Second thing, syndicated loans are very good because then you don't need a credit register and there are no credit registers taking uh, Asia, UK, uh, European Union and United States at the same time. So if you want the whole world, that's, that's the syndicated loans. They tend to be big, the bigger loans uh, for the companies which are more, more important, uh, but you know, uh, one could do this with the US data. There is a US credit register with Anna Credit in Europe, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a question of, of data. So if, if we will have another data, we'll be happy to, to do it with the other data. Okay. Um, <clears throat> waiting for further questions. So I have one question myself, maybe a bit more of a comment as well. Uh, on your your result that uh, banks uh, on average tend to switch from lending to brown firms directly to lending to green firms rather than uh, supporting the brown firms in the transition uh, to become green firms. Now, 
how does that uh, compare with the fact that many of the brown firms actually tend to be, so to say, good credit? So they are strong balance sheets. You know, Big Oil has a strong balance sheets, profitable companies, whereas many of the startup green companies are not so good credits. So uh, how does that add up in, the, in terms of the risk-based uh, framework where, where the banks should be basically thinking about uh, the riskiness of their loan books uh, rather than um, jumping directly from brown to green lending? So this is, uh, this is always it's a wonderful question. Um, yeah, so basically, let me just rephrase it. Um, so we know in banking that banking, uh, you need collateral and, um, and these brown firms, they have a lot of collateral, like big factories, like big things, like real estate, things like, you know, um, and then you can place that as a collateral, uh, for instance, and then it's easier to borrow against, against collateral. And many green firms, you know, they do new technologies, which are, you know, may, maybe patents, like uh, we were discussing in this state owned bank, like, you know, like for electrical cars, like, like some particular designs, but everything was like a patent. And you can only borrow against that collateral, which is a patent, but you know, you know, you know, it's, it's, it's complicated. So. So this implies that on average you tend to give money to the to the brown firms rather than to the green. And precisely what you said is what the what makes that the European Central Bank in the quantitative easing they give more money to brown firms than to green firms. So basically, they, no, the European Central Bank, even if it doesn't want, is discriminating. I don't know whether this is the right word, but it's say favoring brown firms versus green firms. Um, and, you know, and, and maybe they are changing, they're going to change the policy, right? Maybe they are realizing about this and they're going to change the policy. But what you just said is, 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 is there. Oh, we, did, we did something in the paper. Um, we did something, you know, it's not. Which is basically at the end. You know, we are your your point is that the risk, the financial risk of one type of firm and the other type of firm is different. So we can measure risk in different ways, like rating. Here we also put the, this risk measure is how volatility, how how many you know is your profits and your leverage is like a Z score and the volatility. So how how far away are you from the in a sense from default? Just to to try to control for your channel, the channel that you are saying. And, you know, there is a reduction. This is 19th, this is 24th, and 24th, and my, you know, to 19th, there is, you know, five points out of 24. So it's at a 20% a 20 reduction. So, so what you said is, I cannot agree more. But, you know, uh, that's why we are realizing about all of us and policies are changing. Precisely because what you said, uh, what you said. Let me also say that now, since we are in the, I mean, this is very speculative. I mean, I don't know whether our paper can can say anything about this. But going back to what you said, these these firms, the polluting firms, have been constrained. Not only because we show it here, but a typical point that one would say right now is that we have a, an energy crisis in Europe. In part, also, so there are many issues like the European, like a European energy common market, uh, the war, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there is also a, some people argue that there has been an underinvestment on some of these brown energy companies, and now potentially, if you want to increase production, it's much more difficult. And that will be consistent with this evidence. This evidence that uh, that those brown firms were affected by the change in policy after the Paris Agreement in 2015. Uh, just to, you know, just to balance the balance the, the, the answer. But thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. We have one uh, question here from the floor. So um, 
in waiting for the microphone, I think there's one question also on the chat. I'm not sure if you saw that, Jose Luis. I can read it out here. Yeah, uh, please. Yeah. So what do you think is happening in bank institutions given your results? Is it an adjustment of pricing methodology of banks to charge higher interest rates from brown firms? Or is it credit policies to exclude loan granting to brown firms altogether? Yeah, so yeah, this is, um, this is in a sense uh, related to the previous question. And I think, um, I think uh, our evidence is more on the quantities than on the prices. Let me just tell you my experience why it's more on the quantities uh, than on the prices, like in our own experience in, in, in the bank in which I am board member, is there are some particular firms that we don't want to lend, which might be bad, eh? because uh, I'm not saying that this is perfect, but so you don't want exposure with the firm. It's not that you are get you know, you want to be compensated for some risk, which is either transitional risk, official fiscal risk, or reputational reputational risk. So you you just cut, just cut, and and this is my experience, and this is what we get um, we get in the data. So it's more the quantity rather than the price mechanism. Thank you very much. And then we have uh, Jakob, please. Yeah, sorry. I, I guess so. My question is: Have you? I mean, when I look at your results, and you, that the goodness is you're losing using uh, listed firms, right? Is there a is there a Tobin's Q point in what you're doing here? Have you have you looked at the profile of the of the quote unquote brown firms that you are looking at? Because I because I guess I guess you understand the point that I'm trying to get to, right? Yes, that, I, I understand. I understand. <laughs> that's a that's a very good question as well. So we have not done heterogeneity. So before there was this point about whether banks were more brown uh, had more legacy assets, more brown versus green legacy assets, and whether that was changing the effect. So it's a heterogeneous question. And your question about the Tobin skew of the firm, which is, you know, it has very good uh, investment opportunities or not, but this, this is what the Tobin skew is telling me, telling us. We, we have not analyzed that, and that's why I always uh, stress, and we can have the Tobin skew because we have listed data, you have listed firms, and so get the Tobin skew is, 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 is pretty easy. The thing is that what we have done here, we are the first paper doing this, and we have done the average effect. I mean, the paper is, is very long. Uh, this is an academic paper at the end. And there are many questions which are very interesting to, to follow up. And on heterogeneity, we did uh, the previous question because, you know, it, there is an issue about is it just coming, is the banks, you know, over and above the risk of the firm, financial risk of the firm, is it changing that? And that was a control controlling thing. In your case, it's more the Tobin skew, meaning I guess your question goes to if the you know if the market is thinking that a particular firm, you know, has you know a particular the market is given the price in the market and given, given the book value, the market believes that this private firm is very good with a lot of, of investment opportunities, then maybe the banks are not going to be cutting there, even if it is a brown firm as compared to other firms. I guess this is the point that you are making. And we have not checked that, and we, we think is, it will be super interesting, but we have not checked any heterogeneity because then if you enter into heterogeneity, inter heterogeneity, there are so many aspects to analyzing heterogeneity, which, you know, then our paper will become too large. It's already too big, and it will go too large, but definitely uh, a very interesting question that uh, we will try to push you in, 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 in a future paper or other people can push it in a in different paper. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I don't see any further questions coming up, so I think we are then approaching the end of this uh, session.